Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. My name is David Duck and I host this series of half-hour weekly cable programs produced here at the studios of Portland Community Media. Today our guest is Robin Hanel. Robin is a political economist and currently a visiting professor at Portland State University. He formerly was a professor of economics at the American University in Washington, D.C. and is well known in, for his work on participatory economics. Among his writings, he is also a contributing columnist to uh, the Street, Ro Re Street Roots Weekly newspaper here in Portland. So welcome to the program, Robin. Great to be with you. Great, yeah, and actually it's welcome back because you've been on a couple of times before. Yes, I have been. Yeah, so one of your recent Street Root columns was titled, Why, Why Are the Ruling Elites Destroying Our Economies? Can you talk with us about that? Well, yeah, I was trying to explain um, if, if the policies they're pursuing are not solving the Great Recession, if they're not preventing financial crises, um, if they're making matters worse, then why would they be doing this? Um, aren't they part of society also? So isn't this in some sense, you know, not a wise thing for, for them to do? <coughs> and that was actually a question that I was struggling with. Um, because one possibility is they're just making terrible mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there is some of that. Part of what's going on is, you know, it's being driven by an ideology that's just wrong. Um, but then I realized, you know, it's not really their nests that are being fouled. That which you, when you look at it, um, so there's millions of people out there, you know, who've lost jobs and who aren't going to get them back. That's not the 1%. Most of them don't work or need to work anyway. Um, educational systems are being underfunded, but not the educational systems for their kids. Because um, they've withdrawn their kids from the that's right. public system that we all That's use. right. That <coughs> they don't rely on the public services, you know, that are being gutted by the policies that they're, that they're, that they're pursuing. So for the most part, um, they have managed to immunize themselves um, from a lot of the, the damage that their policies are creating. Um, and I think that's why, I mean, I, I think we need to understand that, that the fact that these are disastrous policies doesn't mean that the 1% um, are being affected the way the rest of us are, and therefore, you know, we shouldn't expect them to be, you know, have an interest in seeing these policies changed. The one area you might argue this, there's a little bit of an exception is in climate change. I mean, they're obstructing any progress with regard to doing something about reducing fossil fuel um, use and emissions. Um, and <clears throat> as we broil ourselves to death, if we continue on this course during the 21st century, um, that they won't be immune from. Mm -hmm. Although they will be more immune than most of us. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> but right. they still will not be entirely immune from that. Yeah. But my, my feeling goes from very early on in the space program was that the that the ruling elites were actually developing the space program knowing that someday they would cause the earth to be <laughs> uninhabitable as we know it and that they could escape and leave us behind. They do believe in escape clauses in the contracts that they devise. <laughs> yes, they do. Right, yeah. So tell us about some of the bad decisions that, that are being made uh, and what effects those have had on well, there's, 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 two, <coughs> there's two huge issues that have to do with the economy. Um, and they are the same two issues that came up during the Great Depression of the 1930s. One is f capitalist finance, the financial system. Um, can you simply, can you allow the financial industry to simply operate free from regulation? And what people discovered and did something about in the 1930s was, no, free market finance is an accident waiting to happen. Um, and we need strong regulations. If you're going to have a private financial industry, it has to be strongly regulated. You can talk about you know, whether markets in general should be free or regulated. But then there are clearly some you know, where the case is so much stronger, and finance has always been that way. Um, 
but unfortunately we tend to forget that and unfortunately the financial industry has very little to do except to continually lobby to get out from under regulation and that's what happened so we had a financial disaster that triggered the great depression and you know in the early thirties and that was followed up at that point in time by very very strong financial regulations which gave us a relatively crisis free financial sector for thirty forty years but the financial industry lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and basically got more and more powerful and bought more and more po politicians and economists to basically go along with the idea that we're smarter now, we know how to regulate ourselves, we can take care of business, you don't have to fear, don't get in our way. Um, and that's what happened and it eventually led to the financial crisis. Now the other thing, so the first issue is, have you got to regulate finance? And the answer is yes. And what's different between now and the Great Depression is in the Great Depression they did it, and we didn't. Mm -hmm. The financial reform was basically, ba the, the, the industry successfully battled to prevent any sort of successful financial regulation, serious financial regulation here in the United States and also in Europe. The second thing has to do with when you're in a recession or a depression, what's needed is fix fiscal stimulus that the immediate problem is businesses are laying people off because they can't sell stuff. There's, there's just not enough people out there that are buying it. And you need the government to come in and be a kind of buyer of last resort. I mean, where does demand come from? Households buy. Businesses buy for investment purposes. Yeah, but the households were tapped out. Um, so you weren't going to get sort of a surge of demand for goods and services from the household sector. Businesses aren't going to buy new machines when they can't sell the stuff they're making with the machines they have already. Those are situations where you need the government to come in and spend on hopefully socially useful goods and services in excess of the taxes they're collecting. Mm -hmm. um, that was the great message of Keynes. That's what it took a whole generation of economists and politicians to learn. Um, in some sense, we learned it during the Great Depression, and we now seem to have forgotten it entirely. Um, certainly in Europe, we are back to politicians, people at the European Commission, the European Central Bank. They are making the same mistake that Herbert Hoover made in the 1930s. Um, and it now only slowly is the popular opposition to austerity um, giving rise to some sort of reconsideration of what have been disastrous policies over there for the past three years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seemed like it seemed like when the uh, you know the, the Great Recession started, that it was uh, that there was a lot of drive for doing the kind of stimulus programs that you talk about. But then uh, it seems like about a year or a year and a half into it, all of a sudden it changed. Well, two it, things happened. One was. As soon as Obama was elected, the opposition political party in the United States, the Republican Party, basically adopted a, a scorched earth policy um, in the sense that they, they, they had one goal and only one goal, and that was to see to it that he was unelected in four years. And I, I think the Republican Party has you know, obstructed any and all things that would have actually improved the economic situation because they want the incumbent to be blamed. They want him voted out. So we had that going on here. Um, we did, when, it, when Obama came in, the public pressure for some sort of fiscal stimulus along the lines of sort of Keynes and the Depression was so great that we did have a stimulus bill in the, in the winter and the spring of 2009. At the time, most good macroeconomists said this is way too small. Mm -hmm. The stimulus is about half the size of what's needed. All it's going to do is sort of diminish the damage. It's not going to turn things around. Um, it's certainly not going to create massive numbers of new jobs. It's just going to save some. Um, and it also had the wrong composition. There was too much in tax cuts, too, much, too little in spending increases, um, too little spending particularly on things like education, health, and sort of environmental and green things because you actually, it turns out, you get more jobs, you know, for your dollar of spending in those areas than you do on things like the military. Mm -hmm. um, so we got a little bit of a stimulus and I, I think one of the huge mistakes of the Obama administration was he bought into this huge uproar about we have a 
terrible deficit problem in this country. We have to do something about it. He actually facilitated, by appointing that commission, he basically helped create the conditions that made it impossible to have a second round of stimulus, one that was really big enough that would have turned our economy around, or at least started to. Um, Europe's in a different ball game. They have persisted in a level of craziness beyond what we have on the issue of, of austerity. But we're gonna come back to that. Yeah, it really seems like, you know, uh, even though we might sit here and criticize Obama for not having stimulated enough, uh, by comparison to what Europe has done, uh, we've gone far overboard. That is true. But only by comparison. <coughs> Some of the governments in Europe have been more willing to take on the financial industry and do regulatory reform. That's where the United States and England have been the worst of the governments in terms of just giving in to finance. Um, on the issue of do we have some sort of a fiscal stimulus, a proper response to a recession, do you really, are you really going to do something to get people's jobs back? Are you really going to do something to get jobs available for the million of kids that are coming out of the school system every year, whose employment prospects in the near future and the medium future have never been worse in the history of the country? Mm -hmm. um, are you really going to do something about that? Um, the problem is that we had a weak stimulus, and then instead of continuing to lead on that subject, I mean, you could say, well, the Republicans were standing in his way, but he helped them with sort of changing the conversation from jobs, what can we get to, let's do what we need for jobs. He helped change the conversation about what are we going to do about the deficit, mm -hmm. and that was a disastrous thing to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. And so, uh, economist Paul Krugman is a, is a Keynesian economist, and uh, you are not. And you know, normally, we would expect a radical economist like you not to be agreeing with him, but but most of the time, you do. This is interesting. It comes up all the time. Um, yes, Paul Krugman is politically he's a liberal, and as an economist, he is a Keynesian. Um, He's also a very, very good and smart economist. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, people are slightly different things, but that's Paul Krugman. Um, I am a radical economist. Um, I think I'm also a good economist. I know what works and what doesn't work and what arguments are fallacious and what arguments aren't. Um, but on the issue, I mean, sometimes you're right. And you're right. Mm -hmm. You're right or you're wrong. Well, on the, subject that, on the subjects that Keynes was talking about, which is, have you, do you have to regulate the financial industry or court disaster? When you've got a recession, does the government have to come in as the spender of last resort? Do you have to forget about the idea of, oh, I've got a budget deficit? Well, you've got a budget deficit because production's down, income is down, tax revenues are down. The way you're going to do something about the deficit is to turn the economy around and get production and income back up. So tax receipts go back up. You have to focus on sort of actually solving the problem. Um, Keynes was right about all that. Krugman knows that and keeps saying it, even though there are many economists that don't listen to it and politicians don't. So I agree with him when he's right. Mm -hmm. The area in which we disagree is that he's very, he, he, he does not believe that there is a feasible, better alternative to capitalism, whereas I do. Mm -hmm. So on that subject, he is very skeptical, and he simply wants to make capitalism work a little more sensibly and thinks there's no better alternative. I want capitalism to work more, better rather than worse because it's ordinary people who suffer when it doesn't, but I also want people to come to the realization we can do better things. Okay. There's a better way to do this. Okay. Talk, develop that for us. What, what's, what's the better way? The easiest way, I think, for people to understand it is for, for the last 300 years, we have essentially, as societies, agreed that the way we're going to run our economic affairs is based, it's a system based on competition and greed. Mm -hmm. That's what capitalism really is. Um, and we're told every day that that's the only thing that, that works that we as a, as a species, we are sort of socially incapable of doing anything else, um, that this is pretty much what we're stuck with, this is what works best for us, um, don't even dream about anything else. I just think that that is completely untrue, that human beings are capable 
of organizing, managing, and carrying out a system of equitable cooperation. We can make, ordinary people can make economic decisions for themselves, ordinary people can coordinate their economic decisions and activities with one another. Um, we don't have to do it through a set of mechanisms that basically rewards greed and sort of motivates people through fear rather than, you know, cooperate. And I think that's what the big battle is about. I think that at this point, people are discovering that, well, maybe the old totalitarian communist planning system, you know, is in the dustbin of history and may it rest there. I have no quarrel with that. Maybe there's another system that's been around for two or three hundred years that we can now recognize is not really serving our interests, certainly isn't serving the interests of protecting the environment. Okay. So are, 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 there, are there like concrete concepts of new institutions that we would create to do this? People who, people who are critical of capitalism and say, we can, we need a better system and there is a better system don't all agree amongst ourselves about exactly how it should work. We agree amongst ourselves about some broad principles. And that's the most important part. But there are differences of opinion about exactly what would be the best way, best way to go about that. Um, I'm probably best known as an economist for, with my co-author Michael Albert, we came up with a proposal that we call a participatory economy. It's an alternative to capitalism. Um, it's not command planning of any kind. It's not a market system. Um, and I think what distinguishes it is that it, it's a very rigorous proposal. It's a very specific proposal. It's not sort of just vague words about we want things to be better, we want things to be more humane. It's a very concrete proposal about how is it that you're going to make all the economic decisions that have to be made. And it sort of deals with those difficult things. And it says, here's a proposal. Here's why we think this is a better way to do things. And it's one of the proposals that's, that's discussed out there. I made a trip to, I was invited to Europe two years ago, you know, to speak about it, you know, in, in, in Greece and Spain. Michael Albert's been over in Europe speaking about it. I'm going back in the fall to, to Sweden and Finland and, and the United Kingdom. So amongst people who are looking for a better alternative to capitalism, not just neoliberal capitalism, but sort of any kind of capitalism, there are discussions and debates out there. Um, and a participatory, you know, a participatory eco economy, I'm really proud to say, is, is one of the things that's discussed out there amongst people that are looking for better alternatives. That's great, yeah. So recently, there was, uh, the city of Portland was going through their budget process and then there was a group of people who were working on an alternative budget. Right. Would that be an example of, uh, of a participatory uh, economy? There's two things that are going on that are, that, that people who are looking for alternative to capitalism are involved in. At one level, you have economists or people who are sort of thinking theoretically about system design. And on the other level, you have people who are just starting to do things in a different way. And one of the things um, that began and has you know, had a tremendous amount of success is something that's in most places in the world, it's called participatory budgeting. Um, the two places that pioneered it in the 1990s were Kerala, India, the left wing, left united front government in Kerala, India, implemented a massive system of people planning. Um, and the other place it was implemented was in Brazil, um, in Porto Alegre, in the city of Porto Alegre, and then later in, 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 in various states. And this is an idea that's caught on. There are places in Canada that are starting to do it, the city of Portland, and the, the sort of conference that was here. And the idea is very simple, and that is that, well, one thing you can do is there's tax revenues that government authorities collect. You can simply allow citizens to come together in meetings, neighborhood meetings, and plan and discuss how it is we want our own taxes to be spent. That that can be done in a very participatory way at a neighborhood level um, in cities. Um, and, and that's something that I think is a very, very positive development, and it is the kind of thing that a participatory economy says the whole thing can be done that way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also something that, that, that Occupy was saying very early. When, when reporters went down to Occupy and said, 
well, we know what you're against. You, you're saying the Wall Street banks really messed up, and they messed up for everybody, and they're still part of the problem. Um, but what are you for? And that was a very difficult question for the people at Occupy to answer because there were a lot of different people there who would come there for different reasons. Um, so they didn't have a list of, oh, we support this bill or we support this program. They didn't have that. But what they said back was basically, I think, the best answer possible. They said, well, look at how we're doing things. We have an assembly where everybody comes and everybody can talk. We figure out ways to make it easier for people who have a difficult time expressing themselves to, to go ahead and do that. And we, are, we don't know what our program will be. We just know the process we're going to use is going to be a democratic participatory process. And isn't that what America was supposed to be about? And that's what we want to get back to. Um, and I think that's the, gen that's the broad idea. We do not, that ordinary people can meet and through participation in democratic decision making, we will make mistakes. Mm -hmm. But look what the elites are doing. <laughs> How much worse could we do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's, that's not a very high standard to, to That's have right. To be. Unfortunately, <laughs> right. Saying, Unfortunately. We do, saying we would do better than they're doing right now isn't a very high bar. Right. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, Recently, in Europe, there have been a series of elections, and those people who have been promoting austerity seem to have been voted out of office. What does that tell us about the future? Tell us, it tells us people have good common sense. Um, if you look in the last three years, um, there's not a center-right government that presided over austerity or a center-left government that presided over austerity that hasn't been shown the door by the voters. And that's a good sign. Um, Zapatero, who was a socialist government in Spain, when he imposed austerity, was voted out. Um, Papandreou um, was the leader and the, and, and the prime minister of the Pasak government in Greece, and he was voted out. Um, in France, we just had the same thing happen. Sarkozy, who presided over and was sort of working in tandem with Merkel in Germany on the austerity program, um, he was voted out. Um, so you, the voters have said, we're not for this. Mm -hmm. um, this is unfair, and it seems to be counterproductive. All this austerity is doing is dramatically shrinking our economies. And the more our economies shrink, the harder it is for us to pay back. Mm -hmm. So it's unfair, it's counterproductive, and it's even suicidal if the only thing you have, if, if the only goal you have is sort of preventing defaults and making sure that debts get paid, it's actually not even accomplishing that. Um, so that's what's happening in Europe. They have, produ they have pursued a fiscal austerity, you know, that's much more draconian than what we have had through sort of political stalemate here in the United States. Um, I am much more positive about what's going on in Greece than the vote in France. Tell you the truth, I think that if the, if the French Socialist Party had happened to be in power the past three years, I think they're the ones that would have just gotten voted out. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that they would have done anything different than the, uh, than the Social Democratic Party in Greece did and the Social Democratic Party in Spain did. I think they would have gone along with, well, it's regrettable, but we have to accept austerity. We're sorry. We feel your pain, but there is no alternative. That's the way the left center governments have sort of portrayed it. Um, and they've gotten voted out, and correctly so. In Greece, there's some, the, the, there's some very interesting things going on. In, in the big picture, what we need is we need much more powerful social movements. In the big picture, what we also need is a, grow, a, a growing movement that says, you know, capitalism really isn't the best way to go about things. Equitable cooperation is a better way to do things. And we're going to start to sort of build institutions and do things differently. You need a movement like that. You need more powerful social movements, including union movements and workers' movements. And the other thing you need is you need some sort of an electoral sort of presence and strategy, you know, that fits together. 
And right now in Greece, we're doing well on all three cylinders. Mm -hmm. um, the, what the, the, the young people call themselves sort of anti-authoritarian. And they are disgusted with the system. They say it's failed us. We have no faith in it. We want a new system. Then you have left political parties that finally after two or three years, I was over there two years ago, and I was surprised that these left political parties were not taking a higher percentage of the vote away from the Social Democrats who were administering austerity. And that just tells me I'm always too impatient. Uh -huh. It took a couple of years. But in the election, the center-right and the center-left political parties that have dominated Greek politics for the past 40 years, they just got obliterated because they had both presided over austerity. And mostly people drifted and voted for the left parties. Okay. So you now have a possibility in their end. There's, it's a good thing there's going to be a new election on June 17th because the left political parties are now going to pick up more votes. And that's one of the reasons that they didn't agree to some sort of compromises that would have probably not helped fix anything anyway. Um, they realized right now Sirtsa, which is the left coalition, Sirtsa got more votes than PASOK. A large part of the reason that people voted for PASOK ever was they thought Sirtsa was throwing their vote away. Ah, but now voting for PASOK is throwing your vote away, and everybody knows that in, this, uh -huh. in the next election that's coming up. So I think there's a very realistic possibility that we will get a true left coalition government that is anti-austerity, that says we are not, we're going to repudiate the debt, we're not going to implement these austerity programs, and whether we stay in the euro or not, it's basically, it's not going to be decided by us anyway. Um, and I think that, that go the weakness of that government will be, do they basically have sort of forces in the street that will back them up when the inevitable sort of Greek military and the Greek right wing and the US and the CIA and the NATO start thinking about whether they're going to allow this. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very important that the that the anti the anti austerity that 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 the the anti authoritarian youth movement provides some real street muscle to say you just aren't going to come in here and have an, and have an easy coup d'état. Okay, and I'm sorry because our time is up. Thank you very much. Hey. So that that sounds like an optimistic note at the at the end of the. I'm very optimistic about what, what be, might be happening in Greece, and I Great. think that if it happens in Greece, some other countries may follow that way. Excellent. Good. So we've been talking with Robin Hanel. Robin is a visiting professor of economics at Portland State University. The uh, mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Visit our national website at www.thealliancefordemocracy.org. Uh, thanks to our crew today, Roger Bates, Dave King, Janet Morris, Joan Horton, Philip Jefferson, and Tom Thomas, and thank you for watching. We'll see you again next week. Bye.